Welcome to the Wicked Podcast, where we read the business books you don't have the time for. I'm Marcus Kirsch. And I'm Troy Norcross. And we are your co-hosts for the Wicked Podcast. So on Tuesday from 3.15 to 3.27, I'm supposed to be doing yoga. From 3.27 to 3.43, I'm apparently doing something with the dog. From 3.43 to 7.15 in the evening, I'm in a four-hour workshop. Uh, this is what my calendar looks like. What does your calendar look like? I, I don't use a calendar. I just like, you know, I just rock and roll it. Oh, right. So, I just, it, so I, I just sit down, I meditate, take my vitamins, and uh, and then things come to me. You know, team meeting to invite URLs come to me. And then somehow magically they transfer to my laptop. And there again, there are people and I talk to them. And uh, yeah. And that's that's how it works. So I transcended okay. beyond. So yeah. you you are totally meditation woo woo calendar, and I'm down to the last thirty seconds kind of calendar. Yeah, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm spiritually hooked up to the cyberspace now, or, or, or the meta space. Well, meta space. Um, right. So okay, moving swiftly on, who's on the show today, and why are we talking about calendars? Because we're talking to Rick Pastor today and his book Grip. One of the surprise hits of my, I say, was it 2021? I don't know. It's translated now, mm-hmm. sold tons of copies, and it's all about how you manage your time, how you set goals and time of the essence of today, tomorrow, the year, whatever. Uh, lots of levels and super interesting, very focused conversation we had with him about your time, your control over it, and how you should set it, and how you should negotiate it, and that. Beautiful. But um, what were your takeaways? You know, we, we covered a lot of ground, and it is indeed a, a, a far-reaching book, trying to help people, both millennials and older boomers, such as myself, to rethink how we manage our time. And he was like, one of his points that I liked was, use your calendar to drive better conversations with your managers and your leaders. It, it's one thing to say, I can't do that. It's another thing to say, look, here's my calendar. I can do what you ask me to do, but what is going to have to be taken out? You choose what the priorities are and driving better conversations, which led me to one of my favorite quotes, which is, if you never say no, your yes doesn't mean as much. But looking at the scowl on my face that you may or may not choose to share with the rest of the viewers, exactly what was your takeaway? Because obviously you're not valuing my takeaway. Now, I do, but I, I, I recognize that you stole it yet again, at least 30% of my point. Or no, point I didn't. Like, yes, you did. Because it's basically about, if you're saying better negotiations with your manager about your time, I said, like, well, what I liked is the control and the enablement that he proposed to your own life. Because you never do it. Like, okay, we just wait for our manager to tell us what to do, and then we do it, and then we're unhappy, or whatever. He said, look, you shouldn't be just booking 20% of your calendar. You should be booking way more than that. Didn't give us a number. But I think that was what he was implying. It's like, look, you know, this is your time. You need to manage it. And, 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 and I drew the I drew the um, parallel of like, well, if you're doing that, you're close to like running a contract with a client where you say, well, you know, this is the original scope. If you change this now, there's a change process. That means either, you know, I charge you more or I have to de-scope other things. Uh, so not too dissimilar of a conversation, but I think, you know, there's quite some enablement going on there, which I think should happen. I think it's a great idea that he brought there to us, which is exactly that. If you start to manage your time, if you start to control, uh, more control of your time, you're going to have a better conversation, you're going to have better negotiation, and you will be able to do your work. Because as COVID has shown us, I think 10, 15% of more meetings are happening, less time for actual work has been happening and people are deprived of having control over their time. So I quite like the idea of this enablement of the workforce of like saying, look, this is what I need to do. Here's my calendar. And he said so, like, use your calendar as a negotiation tool. It's like, look at my calendar. Here's my reason why I have to say no. Now, And I think if you, if you work forward from that, a lot of managers, a lot of leaders they understand that you're saying no, but what they really want are solutions. So to come to them and say, look, we can bring in some outside resource to, to fill the gap. I can justify this. 
Um, I can deprioritize something else and I can do this. But it's not just no, it's the, it's the negotiation. It's, uh, I can't do that, but what we can do, the we and can do, that's more solution focused. But before we give away all of Rick's book, let's go talk to Rick. Before the interview, a quick word from our very first sponsor, Sandcaster. We use Sandcaster for all our audio and video recording, and it's a very nifty tool that splits up all the channels for very easy editing. Sandcaster is used by 10% of all active podcasts. You can get 40% off the first three months and unlimited audio and video recordings with our special coupon code, Wicked Podcast. I repeat, I repeat, I repeat, Wicked Podcast for 40% off. And now the interview. Hello, everyone. Today we're here with Rick Pastor. Hello, Rick, and thank you for being with us. Thank you for having me. So as usual, we start at the top, which means, can you please tell our audience who you are and why you wrote the book? Okay, so uh, let's think about how far I go back in time. I'm, um, uh, I'm an engineer. Uh, I founded uh, now multiple companies. The first one that I did was an agency. Then I joined a startup. And now I launched my, I, I'm working on a new startup. And the, the red line, like the thing that, it, that, it, that connects um, that work to the book that I wrote is that I found that um, as a new manager, but also as, uh, as, a, as a leader of a group with a lot of young people, I noticed that a lot of, that a lot of us, uh, or actually all of us have never been really taught how to work, right? So um, we just end up doing some, 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 some sort of method. We, we end up applying uh, some ideas that we pick up here and there. And the thing is that, of course, there's a stack of books that um, you probably have have uh, have read, uh, and maybe some some listeners uh, also also did. However, most of the people that are uh, trying to get their work done, like there's one billion knowledge workers out there, don't have the time or even the mental capacity to do so. To read uh, to read David Allen, to read Stephen Covey, to read um, all of the different brilliant books out there. And basically what I did when I was at the previous startup is um, I thought about what should I give my team? How can I make the most uh, dense, the most compact guide that should be a one pager of how to structure their week? Well, long story short, that's ultimately what, uh, what ended up being the book uh, Grip. I self-published that in the Netherlands. It sold, uh, I, I thought initially that it should maybe sell 3000 copies and I would be super happy with that. And now it's, it's sold over 75,000 copies. Um, uh, and then uh, I thought like, okay, what would be something else that I could try? Maybe see if I can get it translated and then launch it internationally. So here we are. Super. Right. And um, first question, and it's one of the ones that I talk about quite a lot is, is your book targeted towards millennials or does it also work for boomers? People like me who are, uh, you know, old and bitter and set in our ways. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I will try to not offend anyone um, in, in oh, the room. Oh, on this show, you can offend Please people. do. You okay. can offend Troy as much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So I think ultimately we all have to deal with um, with time, right? We all have to deal, wait, make decisions about how we spend it. And while I initially wrote it for people that uh, run their first job, that are running into the first time issues, I also also get a lot of feedback from readers that are um, actually like uh, nearing their like their age of, of quitting their job, nearing their pension, nearing their um, like their age of of leisure, uh, and instead they return to the principles in the book. Um, uh, that are actually not that complicated because it's about how do you spend your time? How do you make decisions, better decisions, how to, how to spend your time? And that's a universal problem. And um, again, while I uh, figured that the way I write it, the technologies that I use in that are targeted towards young people um, that grow up in a digital age, um, they're actually also very much for boomers. So I think on that one, I just had uh, a conversation literally today about two hours ago about, in particular, calendars and using your time. And the conversation there is probably not a very surprising one, which was, you know, uh, 
what people never figured out or never discussed since COVID was, um, you know, how to use time and when to book in meetings and when to do work. Mm. And because uh, the person who talked to me basically said, you know, look, somehow it happened that more and more we're just booking out time with meetings and we never get anything done and never agreed on anything. And I remember having uh, two months into COVID, I did a survey about exactly how people felt about it, and one of the things they talked about was like, my boss doesn't respect my time, nine to five. Uh, we never discussed about when I wanted to put my head down and just work and produce stuff. So I end up in all these meetings. And I think st the general statistic is about 15 or 20 percent more meetings uh, since since COVID or since Zoom or whatever. Um, tell us a bit more about how bad our relationship is with our calendar, because that seems to be quite a thing in the book. <laughs> yeah. So, OK, maybe taking a step back first is that I should explain the place of the calendar in the book, because that's a different, uh, that's different from most of these type of books that go about, okay, you want to get more stuff done? Well, write the list. Well, that's a second place in the book. That's the to-do list stuff that's in the second chapter. The first chapter is actually on the, on the calendar. It's the biggest chunk of the book because for me, and that's something that I saw in my own practice, but also with a lot of people, that's where you really notice when, um, your schedule is too full when you notice that you're overbooked, where you notice where you actually spend your time on. And this is the only one, that's the only, actually one of the only tools, maybe the only tool that's finite. And to me, that's like, that's a, that's a key insight because we are spending our time like it's like it, like we have an endless, uh, an endless uh, amount of it, which of course we don't. And the fact that I'm um, presenting you with this finite canvas that we, of course, already use, uh, but then force force you, in, in quotes, force you to map out how your work fits into this, into this calendar, clearly shows you where you have, where you have issues. Because people say to me often, like, Rick, I try to work with the calendar more. I try to put in all my work because that's my suggestion, right? So first you put in your meetings. You, f you put in preparation time, you put in time to process meetings properly, you put in travel time if you have it, and also make time for work, what's important to you. Then people ask, I, I try to do this, but it, it won't fit. So how can I make it fit? And of course, the answer is um, it won't and it, it doesn't have to um, because you really need to make start to make these tough decisions on what will what, what, what you will tackle this week and what you won't. And that will give you peace of mind um, to actually say no more, uh, and, and with, but with a, with a solid, with a solid story. So the thing that I always share, I'd, I'd like to share is that I work with, um, with a guy, uh, his name is Bram, uh, at, at one of my previous companies. And I showed this to him. He was one of the, one of the, one of the most brilliant designers that I, I've worked with and also an engineer. So I had a lot of questions for this guy. So to, to pick up work, uh, to work on special projects and stuff like that. And at some point, um, he, like I asked him one other question and then he would say, okay, Rick, uh, I will show you my calendar now. And I was like, oh shit, this is, well, actually what you, what I taught you, but now you're going to use this against me. And of course he showed, he, he, he showed me his, his calendar. He was fully booked and he basically said, Rick, um, you have another question. It will take me one afternoon to tackle this. So you decide which one of the things that is in my calendar I can drop because otherwise what you will ask from me is that I work in my evenings or in my weekends. Well, you can also ask that from me, but then that's, that's a really like, um, well, that, that got in my face, right? That's uh, that was to up to a point where I was like, before that I could just ask him a question and then he would uh, respond to like, I can do that. I can fit it in. Or he would say, well, that will be tough, but I will see if it's possible. But of course, that puts the problem uh, with him as an employee, and that what ha that's what happens. Uh, that's what happens all the time with us is that a manager asks you a question. Um, this is something that I come across a lot. Uh, a manager a managers ask a lot of questions. That's what they are here for. Uh, but uh, and, and and we we complain that we have too much on our plate. But those two um, don't really connect, right? The manager asks for a different type of response. They really want to see why that something will not or will fit. And the calendar actually provides you with this answer. So this is a really long answer uh, to the question, how our calendars are, how we uh, use our calendars in a problematic way. The key is 
that not all not everything is in there for most of us and so it's an incomplete picture and our managers treat it as a complete picture so if that happens uh, we as a manager or as a team assume that someone has time but actually they don't they work on some on important things so as soon as you start putting them in you will have more discussions on how you spend how you spend your time but that's a super valuable discussion because now we're talking about what you are actually doing and if that is really important truly for the, for the team for yourself for your company yeah. <clears throat> one of my favorite quotes is um, if you never say no your yes doesn't mean as much. Yeah, that's brilliant. And really, really kind of putting focus on when to say no. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take your, your idea of managing calendar and showing your calendar and, and all of that is great. Do you realize that roughly 20% of my calendar is stuff that I put in? And the other 80% of the calendar is stuff that other people put in because they've decided it's important for me. And, and this kind of goes down to the whole meetings thing. And when that happens to me, I typically say, thanks for inviting me to the meeting. Uh, what's the agenda of the meeting? What is the expected outcome of the meeting? Who else is going to be in the meeting? And what do you expect me to contribute to the meeting so that I can show up and be prepared? And the average response I get is, ah, because they've done zero of this preparation. Um, exactly. How does that line up with what, what you're trying to, to suggest to people? So I think the whole, the whole setup of the book is that it's targeted towards individual behavior and that's very much on purpose so it's like the whole thing is filled with stuff that you can do on your own without having to change your team your environment or your manager and i think that's key because i found that a lot of times people reject ideas like this one because they have to interact with other people they have to get other people to do stuff right so you have to ask your manager hey give me a reason for putting this in this manager has to change his or her behavior that's super difficult so um, actually, I don't have a specific guidance for that one uh, because uh, I would say, okay, let me rewind the clock a bit. How did you end up with the calendar that's for only 20% filled with your responsibilities? That's probably because you are too late with scheduling time for the stuff that's really important to you. It's probably because your story about how you're spending your time is uh, happening on Monday or Tuesday morning where your calendar is already fully booked. But if you uh, look in, look a bit into the future, let's say two or three weeks from now, I can guarantee you it's there's only a couple of things in there. So what you can do, if you, um, if you really rewind the clock and put the ball in your own court again, is saying, okay, if it's impossible for you, let's say we're recording this on a Monday, let's say it's impossible for you to, um, uh, to set up your week right now, what will happen if you start uh, doing that on Friday, let's say next Friday, um, for the week after. If that's impossible, do it for the week after that. Um, how much of your time can you um, can you pencil in already um, to work on the things that are important? And of course, the question then turns to what is important? Well, that's the conversation that we should have, right? And that's also a very valuable conversation that you, that you could have with your manager. Uh, and you notice that I'm talking about managers a lot because I feel that especially in these type of conversations, podcasts, um, that are talking to a specific group um, that is really easy to think about, uh, more entrepreneurial uh, people that are really able to set their own courses, set their own calendars, but the biggest chunk of the people are actually are not, uh, or think they cannot do that. Um, but they actually have way more tools than, um, uh, than we often uh, talk about. And, and one of that is of, uh, that of the conversation of, hey, what are the three most important things you want me to focus on for the next month? This is a conversation that almost never happens. So we assume that we know what's important for the team. We assume that we know what's important for the company. We also assume that we have some kind of an idea in our own brains of what's important for us. Well, put those things to paper, map those out to how your calendar is actually filled, um, and you will see one massive results, uh, but also it will be way easier to say no, because if your manager said, here are the three most important projects for the next three months. And you will start filling blocks in your calendar with exactly that work. Um, well, if the manager then adds something on top, you're not talking about, can I fit it in? But you are you will be talking about, hey, but did the priorities change? Should we change that? Because then it's fine. Then I will throw out the blocks that I, in, that I have in there. Then it's easy. Um, if not, 
well, uh, well, you decide what I do, one or A or B. Well, it's one of it's one of both. Uh, so, I think that for me was fundamental in um, trying to give the reader uh, what what kind of position you have, uh, regardless of that, give you more tools to uh, gain control over how you're spending your time and dealing with these kind of things that are happening all around us. So I think this is what you just were diving into is for me personally, like I think part of a major, really, really big thought, right? Because you talk about control, you talk about understanding priorities. And those are the two things, for example, I have to deal with all the time when I work in change and transformation and basically look at how do modern teams work? How do we enable people as a leader or a manager rather than just micromanage and tell people what to do? and take control of them because then you're going into, I don't know if you remember this theory X or Y, you know, like there's, there's seemingly two, two schools of thoughts, like the old classic one, which means I need to manage people, tell them what to do. Otherwise they're not going to do anything. And the other one, which is I should enable people to be the best as they can be. So I give them everything they need in order to do the job because they're grown ups, they're professional. And if I give them that freedom, they will perform and they'll love their job. How do you, I mean, it's great that you're talking about people should enable themselves more and understand those priorities. Um, so maybe I was stepping out a little bit of the context of maybe the book, even just managing your time. What that aspect of saying how many people know what the priorities actually are and if they change, you're going to, you know, like when you, this is, this is even close to when you're providing a service, you're on contract. If someone changes the requirements of the contract, you're going to change the change process. They're like, well, if this changes, I either charge you more or I have to take something away from the other one, right? So are you saying that you want to enable people more to have that kind of relationship, right? Where you're saying, well, if you as a manager don't give me those principles and those priorities properly, I'll not comply because you're not doing your job. Is that is that what we're getting to? Is that sort of, and I'm trying to be quite rebellious about this, right? At this point, yeah, so yeah. what do you think? No, no, I and, and I I do agree, and I see I see multiple things, multiple things here. One is that a huge a huge group just just wants to get by, right? They just want to um, do their job well enough uh, for them to survive. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm they get handed a lot of things to tackle. Um, but they have never really consciously about uh, thought about when to do that in their, in their, in their week. Like how does this map to how I'm spending my time? And this chunk of uh, this group of, of people, I could, um, have a huge effect on the quality of the work just by realizing, and this is not new for you, but realizing that we are not the same at any given point in the week, just like we are not the same at any given point in the year. We are, we try to be uh, on the same level of performance at every, any given hour, at any given day of the week, and also at, at, at any given month in the year. That's something that we put on ourselves. That if you look at the history of time, uh, history of how we how we've done our work, is is quite ludicrous, right? We we feel that we are able to just sit down in an office which which is full of light uh, where it's where it's cold or dark outside versus it's hot and it's summer and expect for us to be in the same state that's not the case and we but we do treat it at that way we also expect our teams to perform in the same way so um what i'm getting at is if we want to just do our work um and the way it's handed to us then we need to have a solid understanding of how we work. Just like a top performer is also really aware of uh, when they are best at their performance training. Some, are, some of them are more, more in the morning, some in the afternoon. They need to eat specific things. They need to analyze how they do that. They need to analyze their gear and so forth. And we, for work, we just don't do that. We just like, uh, okay, this is the tool that's handed to us. Um, at nine, people walk in the office. At five, they walk home. Um, okay, apparently work needs to happen in this time frame. So one part of this is that I want to give that group the tools to uh, manage their weeks in a better way. 
So that's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer is what you're getting at is, okay, but if you want to go, st go a step further and think about what's the future of work, well, that's way more um, um, outcome driven than, than hours and time driven, right? Um, but still, we need to spend that time. So then the question becomes, can I make a promise on delivering something in a set amount of time? Because that will still be a, a, like a boundary that we're, that we're discussing, that we're thinking about. You as a, as a manager or as a client, you will request something with, with a certain scope by a certain date, right, from you. And um, so the factor that we can influence is how much time we spend on it. And we need to have some kind of a some kind of a tool set, some kind of a way of working to allow us to make a promise that we can actually keep, that, that we can actually deliver on, if that if it makes sense what I'm saying. So and and this is a question that before we would just say, okay, we'll we'll I will show up for five days a week in the office and then I'll we'll see how far I will get. Uh, right? That's the approach that a lot of people uh, take. If we were, if we're flipping that around and we're saying there is no office anymore, I want to work from anywhere. Um, actually, let's also throw out the the forty hours forty hour work week concept. Let's also throw it out of, outside of the window. Then we'll have to think about um, how we can make promises um, that we can actually commit to. And for that, we need to be able to make some kind of prediction on. Um, how fast we can do a certain type of work. And that's where I also return to the calendar because if I'm using the calendar as a way to book in time for work, I now also have a feedback loop on, can I actually make it in time? Can I, like, how, how long does it take for me to, I don't know, it could be a question for you. How, do, how long does it take you, for you to process this podcast? If you, if you just put it on a, on a to-do list, well, probably you don't have any sense of how long it takes. If you have to book it in your calendar, well, you now you do. And now you know if you run over time, so next week you can adjust it. And then over time, you will start to be to become way better in terms of estimate, estimating how much a certain type of work will, will, will cost you. So now you can also make promises. Mark, because you had an agile comment, I could see in the background. So make your agile comment and then I'll, I'll pick it up from there. Okay, I thought you go first. For, I go first. So yeah, I think... This gets me to a really interesting one because we had we had one or two guests over that talked about teal organizations, which are massively self managing teams and all of that. And one of the things that was there as a comment was like, we don't measure time anymore, right? Uh, we measure outcomes. We measure like getting there. There's another one, and I think it's uh, tried to remember where it's from name or company. I think somewhere around Amazon or someone, but it's basically saying. You know, of all the things you're going to be doing, 1% of what you're doing will actually lead the company to the next growth and benefit and value and, yeah, and profit. Everything else is not. So the trick is, how do you get to, how do how you find that 1% as quick as possible? And, you know, as a service designer, I would say like, well, you go in the experiment. And as someone who's doing agile, you go on your experiment, you test, 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 and eventually mm -hmm. you find the thing that clicks and you build up iteratively till you find that 1% that is yep. good enough to go there. How do you then, I, 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 that for me is the future. If you're asking like, so how do you deal? How do you promise? Well, I promise that I will hit that target as fast as I can, but I can't possibly promise when, because the uncertainty level of today's complex world is just too high. And I think anyone who promises anything is, is, is either lying or is totally out of scope. Really, 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 you know. And I've seen this again and again where time restrictions are put in and it doesn't help. So I think, in essence, not, none of this is detrimental to what you're saying, your approach of manage your time, put your time in, put certain things in. Because I think in a smaller scale, you can always do that. Okay, I spent two hours on this, and we get there, and we build more, and I give you more. Yes, and I'm, I know I'm rambling. I'm trying to make a point here, Troy. Thank you very much. So but if I say that, at the end of that, um, I think my, 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 my question maybe is this.
if I balance my time between talking to people and actually producing something, do you think there's a particular balance to strike between doing that in order to, to get somewhere? Okay, so one, one to your point, what you're just saying is that what you're, what you're saying is, is right, that we are notoriously bad at predicting how much time a certain task will take until you get to a really granular level. And I think that's where people mistake, uh, make this mistake. Like we cannot estimate, so we, we throw out the whole thing while you can estimate a really like a, a, an atomic part of it. And for me, it, that ties into the bigger framework of things because that's, I think, what you're getting at. And also the saying of Stephen Covey of, um, hey, you can, run up a, you can run up a ladder as fast as possible, as fast as you can, but if it's set against the wrong wall, um, what are you doing? Right. And I think so one, we need the granularity of our calendar, of our to do list, of the things that are happening on a day to day to day basis. What's weird is that for teams and for companies, we have a structure of thinking about what's important in the long term. We have, I don't know, big rocks. We have OKRs. We have, I don't know, cycles or scrum or whatever. On a personal level, what do we do? Nothing. Right. We we, we just uh, show up for a certain thing and then do the thing and then go home and then and then ultimately we think hey what are we actually doing what are we working towards and this is why as part of the book uh but uh, but not linked to the book but also because i i, I just implement this on uh, on myself i do this I've, do, I've done this for years is do like getting into a practice of one doing a weekly review which gives you a sense of where you are and where you're going to be in the next week, but also do this on a quarterly level for yourself, setting goals, getting to a habit of um, thinking about taking a little bit of time to think one evening, two evenings per quarter, uh, or maybe a weekend day to think about um, what have I done? What have it yield? What, what, what yielded me and what, uh, where am I going uh, with my life? Where, what do I want my spend, want to spend my time on? And I'm also doing this on a yearly level with, um, uh, with, with spending two days thinking about where am I in life? Um, how do I feel? Not just about work, but also about friendships, family, uh, hobbies, things that make me proud or happy or things that make me sad over the last year. And, and what kind of impact will that have over how I'm approaching next year? And if you ask, how should I spend my time between the two of them? Well, the key thing, of course, is what you need to do is shut off for all of the things that are happening, the notifications, the emails, the stuff, and then sit down and then think about and reflect on, hey, what is actually bringing me this result? How can I measure this? How do I feel about this? What are the most impactful activities that like the 20% that, 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 that give me the 80% of the results? What are those? And then figure those out, think about that, and then use the framework of a week to week basis, like your weekly review and also your calendar, whatever you need, to make those things happen on a structural basis. And I think tying those two in, like a, a really a, a way of, of being able to execute. Um, uh, if, you say, if you say you're going to do a certain thing by tomorrow or by the day after, make it happen uh, because that's a key thing that, 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 that we can do and that we can also can get better at. But also um, having this sense of where you're going, this strategy, like how do you figure this out for yourself? Um, I think those two are uh, crucial for us to, to exist in a world where so, so much more um, demand is placed on uh, our own thinking instead of just uh, a line of people that you can join uh, with the company for the next 30, 40 years and then come out the other end of the, of the line um, and, and be a full-grown uh, person. So to I've, say. I've uh, <clears throat> written things down at different points in my life better and worse. And sometimes I've had those kind of lists and I've had those kind of visions and I've had those kind of year plans and sometimes I haven't. And it comes and it goes. It's, it's not been a consistent thing for, for quite a long time. Uh, I, I love the, the chapter title, Stop Storing Things in Your Head. Um, and yet I do, except for a few random post-it notes, everything is in my head. You would say make smart to-do lists my smart to-do list, believe it or not, is my email inbox. And I have all of my things that need to be done either coming at me or reminding me in my email inbox. 
And as much as I'd love to ask you about three or four more questions, I'm going to hand over to my co-host who's going to ask the last question. Without rambling. Thank you. I'll try. So we always have more questions than time, and here we are yet again for the 80, 84th time, I think. It's episode 84 might be there. Three. I don't know. I forgot. So um, I've been looking at your book and a couple of other books, and there's, 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 there seems to be a trend and a thing going on, not just for self-management, but generally for people to take better care of themselves mm. and enable their life and their work better. And we know all there's a bit of a blurring going on between personal and work life and how to manage time and space and everything. Would you say, what, what's your view on, are we maybe at the precipice of people changing their mindset to be better and more enabled and become something else as a worker completely? I would, I would say that I see a, a lot more um, uh, especially young people that come in and think that everything they do should be f should be fun, should feel good, should be enjoyable from day one. And if not, they will quit and do something else. And that's maybe we're getting to mill millennial territory here. Um, and I, I consider myself uh, actually one of them. So I, I, I feel some of that in the same in the same way. And I think with that, what will also happen is that some structural issues, both personal, but also in a grand scheme of things, get under um, underrepresented and not solved. And I feel that if you would ask, so what, what you ask is, do you feel that this is something, a trend? I think that we're already there and that part of what I what I wrote and what I tried to get people to experiment with because that's what, I, what the ultimate end goal for me is get one thing out of there that you will try to to experiment with next week because what got you here won't get you to the next step so that's the key um, but is what I what I see is that most of that is sh is shaped around what makes what makes us feel good in the moment and that's a really bad way of guiding, um, uh, guiding how to get to what you really want in the end, because that almost never feels really good in the moment, right? Going for a run, uh, initially, it's it's the hor most horrible thing that you can feel. So what I what I'm what I'm getting at is that I actually hope that we are able as uh, also as older like the, the older group that is more used to do stuff that they hate at the beginning for, for, for a bigger, like bigger goal that they're working towards to help get across that that's super valid. That's a super valuable thing. And that's like steering and making decisions on how you feel is uh, in the long run, um, maybe not the smartest thing. Well, Rick, um, I'll thank you. Uh for your insights and for your time. And I'll, I'll close this with, with a nerd quote from Gandalf who said, all we have to do is to decide what to do with the time that is given to us. And I think your book is beautiful going exactly towards that kind of philosophy. So thank you for your time and your insights, Rick, and thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. You've been listening to The Wicked Podcast with co-hosts Marcus Kirsch and me, Troy Norcross. Please subscribe on Podomatic, iTunes, or Spotify. You can find all relevant links in the show notes. Please tell us your thoughts in the comment section and let us know about any books for future episodes. You can also get in touch with us directly on Twitter on at Wicked and Beyond or at Troy underscore Norcross. Also, learn more about the Wicked Company book and the Wicked Company project at wickedcompany.com.